Hey everybody, welcome to Tech Recyc, where we combine the latest neurotechnology with ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm your medical doctor confident, Dr. Cody Rawl. I'm really excited about this episode. We had two expert level meditators with over 60 years of cumulative experience come on and talk about how they've been using the Muse headband with the Mind Monitor Graphene online program in order to track their meditative sessions. Steven and Kevin have a wealth of experience and just hearing them talk about their meditative practices and what to look for on the Mind monitor graphs was truly revealing. Their graphs are so unique that they actually had to go into neuroscience laboratories and get independent testing to confirm what they actually had been seen. Just take a look at these excerpts right here. Um, there's an overriding alpha, but then there's also this tight band of theta, beta, delta underneath it. And they kind of all come together. And we found that in focused breathing practices, that's very common. That and and stay up as long as we our attention is focused into these high frequencies and it feels like you're supercharging your brain and then we drop down through the perineum into feeling the energy in the earth underneath our feet into a deep stillness and as we talked about we we found that by feeling the high energy state when we go down into the stillness there's a real wakefulness, a real awareness that stays highly present as we're going deeper into stillness, into silence, into spaciousness. And in that part of the meditation, we've found that theta rises up to right underneath or sometimes peeking over alpha. It's really a, a, a seems to be a theta dominant state when we're down, especially as we kind of lose the sense of being in this separate physical body and we just feel this spacious awareness or even awareness of awareness itself. Wow, that is some valuable stuff. I've included some time links below in the description so you can jump to where they talk about the different brainwave patterns and meditative techniques within the interview. But I advise you to actually start from the beginning and watch the entire thing so that you can listen to their meditative experience, where they're coming from, what they experience, and how they actually interact with the Mind Monitor program in order to track these meditative sessions. You can check out their website on the link below and be sure to leave any comments on the video if you have questions. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoy the interview. Everybody, it's Dr. Cody Rowell with Tech for Psych. So I've got two very special people with me here, uh, Stephen Altair and uh, Kevin Shaniger. And uh, you guys have practiced meditation for a long time, uh, very seasoned practitioners. And um, the person that uh, helped me become aware of what you were doing in the community was uh, Holly Copeland, who I interviewed a couple of weeks ago. And she had just the, the greatest things to say about you guys. So I'm actually really uh, excited to talk about uh, how you've been using EEG technology in the world of meditation and neurofeedback. So I'd appreciate it if you uh, told us a little bit about your backgrounds and um, where you're coming from and, and more about uh, Heart Mind Alchemy Group on Facebook as well as your, event, uh, your project, uh, Raising Our Vibration. Sure. Well, thank you, Cody. And uh, just thank you for having us on. And we so appreciate the work that you're doing to bring together psychology, meditation, technology, science. You know, this is really a new field. It's a, and it's a cutting edge field and we're learning new things every day. So we really appreciate your forum for, um, for doing this and bringing us on. So thank you. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I think that it wouldn't be what it is without uh, people that have been doing this for so long and, and finally being able to use this, technology that's democratized our ability to, to actually take a look at our brains, you know, no longer is it limited to just people in the EEG neuroscience labs and flying in meditators from, from Tibet or wherever, you know, people are coming from. I feel like people are sort of uh, rising to the occasion and um, have been doing this stuff for a long time and, and using the technology to share really is what I see, uh, especially in these uh, group chat communities and any other things that are sort of rising up from the platform. So uh, Kevin, uh, you tell us about your background and uh, sure. how you came into all this. Yeah, sure. So um, back in college, I was in undergraduate school. I studied philosophy, got a philosophy major. And after my um, undergraduate um, degree was finished, I went on this backpacking trip out 
into the West. I was really a city boy, so backpacking was completely foreign to me. But what happened in that time, I spent a month just backpacking, hiking, and doing a lot of times sitting still in nature and just kind of letting the natural silence and stillness and spaciousness of the landscape kind of inform my mind. And at first it was pretty scary to do that. Silence, stillness, and spaciousness for somebody from the city is, you know, a little um, out of my comfort zone. But over the course of a month, I found that that landscape started to work on me and it started to change how my, the state of my consciousness. And I got really quiet. My mind got really quiet. My body got really relaxed and my emotions became really calm. And coming back from that trip, I can remember being on the plane and saying, wow, this state of being, I've never experienced anything like this before. And I want to know more about this. And so I was just, a, just about to embark on a graduate program in philosophy, specifically phenomenology which is the study of perception and states of consciousness and structures of consciousness. And so I kind of took that experience out in the desert into this program and said, well, how, how does this apply to what I'm learning in, in philosophy? And I found that they weren't talking about anything like that. And so I had to go outside the academic world and started studying Tai Chi and Qigong meditation. And so that was when I was 22. Um, I'm 58 now, so I've been doing it for about 36 years. And in Tai Chi, I did find, and in sitting still in Qigong meditation, I did find that same stillness and silence and spaciousness of the mind in those practices. So I was like, okay, I don't need to go out to the desert to have this experience. I can actually um, sit in my home and have a very similar experience. And so that kind of put me on this path of exploring different meditative uh, traditions um, from Kriya Yoga, started with Qigong Kriya Yoga, uh, did a lot of work with Reiki, uh, with um, Buddhist meditation, mindfulness, Vipassana, and um, led me on a path into what Stephen and I now call subtle energy meditation. So... Um, and I've been teaching that um, since, let's see, yeah, for about the last, since 1991. Um, so however long that is. Yeah, I've been listening to some of your, each of your talks and the subtle energy uh, meditations are just so interesting, how much depth you can go in, but have a bit of a framework in how to control breath and awareness to really create these experiences and um, really amazing stuff. Stephen, um, you tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you came into these subtle energy meditations as well. Yeah, thank, thanks, Cody. And, and much love and blessings for all your work. I think it really touches people that they can reach out to you, not just through technology, but also through your great understanding of the whole practice of meditation. Because I think that's particularly important. Sometimes research has been done by researchers who are not meditators, and so they have a particular perspective on the research that comes out. So, so you know, we're uh, at, both Kevin and I and the community are really grateful to you for that, truly. Um, as far as my background is concerned, it, it started when I was very young, when I was uh, two year, just two years old. I had a recurring dream, which lasted, it, it happened every night, the same uh, particular dream where I was a monk uh, with a companion on a bridge. I fell off and I fell into the sound, that sound of Aum and the light and this intense vibration. And I used to wake, wake up screaming every night. I had the same dream over and over again from the age of two to the age of three. So it really made me curious about what, what is this sound and this light and this vibration that kind of is... It seem, seems to be inherent in me and, and my parents were very worried. They took me to doctors and scientists. So I did have a lot of brain tests done at that very early stage um, for, for epilepsy and they couldn't find anything. They just said, oh, maybe, maybe he's overheated. And eventually a doctor told me to take, to, told my parents to take my clothes off and left me sleeping naked on the bed for, and, and it worked. The dream stopped. 
from that particular day. And that made me exceptionally curious about what it was in this, what was it, what was a monk even at that point? I, I had no idea. I, I was brought up in New Zealand. So it, it brought me to a very early age to Kriya Yoga, very similarly to Kevin and Yogananda's work, and also at a very early age to exploring um, Tibetan, the, the yoga method of chin raising through the um, Dalai Lama. And so I explored t- Tibetan Buddhism and clear light yoga. And I was brought up, uh, interestingly enough, in a Carmelite tradition. My godmother was a um, Carmelite mother superior. So I was brought up in this Carmelite tradition of a centering prayer and honoring, you know, Jesus and Mary and the whole Christian mystical tradition of St. Therese of Avila and St. Therese of Liso. So I was brought up in the, with this really strong devotional practice, which has stayed with me all, all these years. So a lot of my practice before I met Kevin was ex- extremely heart-based and I I had practiced dedicatedly the those uh, the Kriya Yoga and Tibetan Buddhist practices and and the Christian you know esoteric or mystic, mystical practices for many years. I'm I'm Kevin's junior really, uh, about thirty years. So I always call him. He's like senpai in Japanese. He's he's the elder. Um, so I've learned such a tremendous amount from him, and also learned such a tremendous amount from this beautiful community that we're part of. The uh, raising our vibration community of whom Holly is one. And it's, it's very much a sharing part. I mean, we, Kevin and I are facilitators and we bring the years of uh, experience in our different traditions, but it's, it's especially in, in these days of sharing, it's about facilitating and sharing and understanding that our, our graphs are really very sacred measures of our consciousness. Mm. And as such, we learn about both our inner states and our graphs and the science behind it. All, all at one time. And I, I think that's the, the jewel, the precious jewel of where we're at in this current stage of evolution of humanity is that we can touch all those aspects of, you know, the heart, mind and soul of a, a human being and understand much like the Dalai Lama says that this is an incredibly precious human lifetime to, to value and that therefore, you know, we should treat it as such and treat everybody with kindness and bring kindness to the way that we share and talk, to, especially when we're talking about this vibration, you know, the consciousness in our graphs. So that it's really important to share with utmost kindness because there can be a tendency in science to say, well, actually, this is what it is. Whereas, in fact, we know that this is a steadily evolving and uh, industry, or steadily evolving science, and we're uncovering so much about the practice. So that's what absolutely delights me is the opportunity to share with such a large community, you know, including yourself. So I'm, I'm forever humbled. And that's part of, I guess, the, the traditions that I've been brought up with, which are traditions in light and sound and vibration are very humble traditions. I mean, they're, they're very much opening your, your heart to people's practices and looking at ways so that we can bring kindness to all that we share. Yeah. Beautifully said. Stephen, I wanted to ask you about uh, autobiography of a yogi a little yeah. bit. Uh, you, you had mentioned in some of our talks that there was a connection there. Um, you, you had, uh, did you study under Yogananda? Mm, not under Yogananda personally. I, interestingly, I, I heard your uh, interview with Dr. Hart and he spoke right. about autobiography of Yogi and Swami Kriyananda. And curiously, I had exactly the same connection. So I knew at, at the same time, I knew Yogananda's, uh, p- the president of Self-Realization Fellowship that he uh, appointed, Sri Dayamata. I knew her personally, and I knew Swami Kriyananda, who was head of another organization that Yogananda also set up called Ananda. Uh, he, w- he had started that whole spiritual community, which now has something like 300 communities around the world. So there was the, these two sort of figureheads of Yogananda's work, and I was you know, blessed enough to know both of them personally and be able to visit both of them at the same time and learn from them. So I took... Um, initiation Kriya Yoga through a wonderful monk called uh, Brother Anandamoy, who, who's since passed on. And they they have a lovely tradition in uh, Yogananda's work as you go deeper into it, where I have a personal mentor, a brother Sachinanda, who's guided me for many, oh, you know, 30 odd years probably in the traditions of Kriya Yoga. 
And he's always said, you know, very simply to guide people into stillness. But we, we very rarely learn how to still our bodies, let alone still our minds. So he always says, you know, begin with stilling your body and then you'll develop that practice of understanding how to still the mind and heart and then go beyond. So I, I had just a glorious um, opportunity with both Sri, Sri Dayamata and Swami Kriyananda to actually go right into the heart of Yogananda's work and really understand the essentials of Kriya Yoga. And I do think that a lot of the, for example, what's seen in my graphs are just purely an expression of that consciousness because Kriya Yoga is about touching, you know, light, sound, and vibration using particular techniques, using particularly focused attention techniques followed by open monitoring and, you know, to put it in that neuroscientific terms. And I think that's that kind of pattern is something that both Kevin and I have seen and also in the work that we've done with raising our vibration, we've been able to understand a lot more because of the kind of traditions that we've brought to it and, and reading carefully through the research. You know, when you look at a lot of the research, like Lutz to 2004, that, that neural, that what are the neural correlates of meditators who have been working for a number of years? So we studied those quite closely because when we came to Muse, like everybody else, we were relatively innocent and, and naive to what we, we were sharing things that just happened to be how exactly what we were doing. So it was, um, you know, it was a really curious and, and really quite a deep exploration for us as well as the rest of the community at the time. So we're incredibly grateful to Muse for providing that opportunity because to think of the idea of a portable EG headset that you can take on, clip home, plug into your phone, uh, explore mind monitor and, and look at the various frequencies that your brain is producing at any one time in real time is really in itself. I think it's a modern miracle. It's a, just a beautiful expression of the potential we have as humanity to really understand ourselves. Yeah. So thanks for sharing uh, your experience. And I think people appreciate the depth of, uh, you know, your background in bringing, um, all those years of meditative practice into using it. And uh, I love the way that you um, talk about the opportunity there and how much it can be appreciated if you really sort of understand its potential. Mm. Um, and Kevin, we were going to talk about uh, some different meditative strategies um, that uh, have been developed through your guys' group. Would you mind uh, start taking us through that journey and uh, talking about what you've uh, seen on the graphs? along with the experiences yeah well the first first two things that we've really uh, emphasized with our group and this comes from various traditions and can be applied to any style of meditation is the importance of interoception the ability to feel inner sensations and then the attitude of mindfulness to be able to pay attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally like a curious observer. And that, that attitude, both towards our inner experience and, and also toward, in life, is, is really essential to the practice of meditation, as well as to living well and, and interacting well with others, right? So we really start with that foundation of giving people experiences of inner sensations in the body, to whether it's through posture sensations, sensations of breathing, sensations of subtle energy movement in the body, sensations of stillness, silence, spaciousness. So we really start with that foundation. And then we've uh, developed this sequence of seven steps to take people through into a deep meditation state and then also sequentially out of a deep meditation state. Um, so we begin with the idea that you need to have good preparation before meditation. So don't just think you're gonna sit down and, and just start, but think about how do I prepare my body? How do I prepare the environment that I'm in? How do I, what is my intention that I'm bringing to my practice? Bring that all right from the start of the practice because that really creates a supportive um, environment for you to have a successful meditation. So preparation is one. And then we be, next we move into 
conscious relaxation posture and um, again, positive energy, positive mental state cues. That would be two. Again, that's kind of an extension of preparation, getting yourself ready for the practice. And then we move into specific focal points for concentration. So for instance, uh, beginning with breathing, being aware of sensations in the lower abdomen as we're breathing. Okay, so really developing concentration to the point where we become completely absorbed in the breath. Okay, so that there's nothing else that's happening outside of the breath as far as our consciousness is concerned. So conscious concentration into absorption. And through that absorption, there's a moment in the practice when we kind of lose the sensation of being a separate individual. We have a feeling of a spacious awareness. Okay, so a stillness, a silence, a spaciousness that feels like transcendent of our normal individualized consciousness. So transcendence would be the fourth step. And then sequentially coming out of that. So beginning by grounding your experience back in your body. So feeling the sensations again in your body, coming back, we call it returning and grounding. So instead of going from that transcendent state and just rushing off into life, taking some time at the end of the meditation to really come back into the body, ground the experience, and then take some time to reflect on the experience so that we really, we process it. So that could be through journaling or it could be through remembering poignant moments in the meditation, remembering shifts in consciousness and trying to record those shifts in our body so we remember them. So taking some time at the end to really reflect, gain insight into what happened. And then to think about how does this relate to our lives? How do we take this in, move out into the world in compassionate action? And that, that's the seventh step. So um, that's kind of the process, the two foundational skills and interoception and mindfulness, and then the seven steps that we take people through. And you could apply those to any style of meditation. So we just happen to apply it to what's called subtle energy meditation, which is focused on feeling the sensation of life force flowing through the body. And uh, people are normally doing this with use monitor, correct? Yes, yeah, so we, we certainly have a lot of people using Muse and Muse Monitor as they're going through this course. We have a 10 week course that leads people through this um, in a series of uh, eight guided meditations. Um, so a lot of people have been using Muse and Muse Monitor to um, both check in and see what's happening, but also to see what happens over time with this. Because one thing we're, we've discovered is it takes time and practice to not only be able to successfully do all these steps, but also to activate our inner senses. So that this is, we're normally really focused out here, right? On all this sensory, inf external sensory information. So it takes some time to train these inner senses to wake up and, you know, starting with posture and breathing, but then to feel the subtle energy that's something that takes some time to wake up and and if people haven't had a lot of experience with that you know that that is something that's very progressive over a period of time um, and we're but we're seeing that in the graphs we saw even over the course of 10 weeks um, that people's uh, the energy level that showed in their graphs increased over the course of 10 weeks and the people that did that over the course of a year, there was really significant changes in what is shown on uh, Muse Monitor or Mind Monitor. And these are the amplitudes of the individual frequencies you're talking about? Yes. So um, there's different phases to the meditation that we're teaching. There's a, like I said, a concentration phase. There's an energy raising phase. That's where we see uh, gamma and beta frequencies rise up. And then F, what we found is that by raising the gamma and beta frequencies, by focusing into raising energy, 
when you go into stillness, you can go much deeper into stillness while still staying awake. <laughs> because uh, what happens when if you just go into a very still state, especially when you're not accustomed to it, a lot of people tend to nod off or get kind of drowsy or not be able to go in deep into that stillness and silence. So by going into an elevated focus state and then going into a very quiet, still state, you're able to stay very awake within that still state. I've tried to describe something like that so many times in my videos, and I'm so happy to hear you talk about that because, uh, yeah, it is like you could go into a still state on a superficial level, but you get kind of bored just because you're sitting there. But if you bring more of this energy, whether that be like this love or this thankfulness or have hit a higher state before going into the deeper state, yeah. there seems to be this magnetic pull into that stillness. And, uh, I know I, I've heard Stephen talk about that before on on his videos as well. Would you what, what's your take on that, Stephen? Uh, going into these deeper meditative states after bringing the, these heightened energy levels. Mm, well, certainly. Uh, j just before I do go into that, I do want to give a shout out to Holly because, in fact, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned higher amplitude in brainwave in the brainwaves and Holly's research because she's a data research scientist, she did something really completely invaluable for the whole group. And that was, she was able to look at her uh, brainwaves over a period of time prior to, fortunately, the course, and during the course and after the course. And it did show you know, a significant change in the different brainwaves, particularly in an increase in amplitude. And that, that's primarily what we're interested in. We've never really set out to either raise gamma, delta, or any other brainwave. We've actually been more interested in, so what does this do to the health of the individual? What does this do for the calm, overall, compassionate, living circumstances of an individual? And does the overall strength of the brain waves increase in terms of its amplitude and is there increased coherence and synchrony? So, so that's what we've certainly seen and, and Holly was a wonderful example of that. And that's certainly um, as a group where we've got a research group that we are looking at this and looking at projects towards that end, um, which we can talk about later. Uh, and, and, and your question really about how, how has that subtle energy in, in terms of, I, th I think you're saying in terms of love or gratitude or, or higher energies assisted the, um, the depth of the stillness? Yes, cer certainly, it, you know, in line with a lot of the research I've looked at, which is, is in either compassionate non-dual awareness or in love and kindness meditation, um, it, it certainly, I, I, I seem to have the same characteristics for for example uh when we when, when i sit very still prior to the stillness and work with the subtle energies there is a, a connection with prana or the life force which kevin had mentioned earlier that i feel activated in my spine and i felt ever since i got into this work many years ago through yogananda's work I mean, they speak about most yogic traditions speak about prana and, and shakti. Yeah. And that, that energy life force is particularly what we do touch through uh, subtle energy meditation. So when I feel that, my, most of my own personal meditation is centered around, you know, love and compassion and gratitude. So, for example, people who are listening to this, and we could give a short example of this later later on, is that people who are listening to this, instead of just listening with your mind, you can listen to, to this, what I'm saying, with your heart and breathe out, breathe, breathe in and breathe out with a long exhalation, which will, of course, activate your vagus nerve and your parasympathetic nervous system. And if you do this kind of very subtle listening, you have an start to get an idea of the kind of energies that we want to work with in our life. And we always have a choice through our day of being either in a thought of love or a thought of fear, in a thought of dual awareness or in a thought of non-dual awareness. And, and our breathing and our focus on our breathing can really help that. So in the meditations that um, we do, we focus very simply on, in the beginning, on that gratitude and, and love. And drawing that gratitude and love up and with focused attention up 
and through the sushumna or the inner spine. And it's, in my case, it's a very, very, very focused and still practice that I've done for many years through Kriya Yoga. But essentially, it's an extremely bhakti or devotionally oriented practice where it, it feels just as if you're given the most beautiful blessings, as, as if a prayer is rising up in your body and heart and mind. And, it, you know, I'll have tears soon, but it literally, it literally feels like that. We were commenting the other day on, you know, look, looking at photographs of different meditators. And for sure, that, that there's that beautiful bliss that rises in your being when you just feel that deep gratitude for for the practice itself. So that's, so the subtle energy works really closely with that sense of gratitude, love, compassion, and, and bliss that arises quite naturally when we do express gratitude. So we draw that energy up and through and into our bodies and we feel it. You know, quite often during your day, um, we're, we're so involved with social media, you know, anxiety about a virus, um, problems with our job, uh, troubles with our neighbor. And we're not in those restful, calm, grateful moments for, wow, I'm alive. And where actually is my consciousness in any one moment? And the narrative self with its busy, busy stories is constantly there telling us, we'll check up on your neighbor. What are, what are they doing? And uh, yeah, how come that person's not getting the same, you know, perks or how come I'm not getting the same perks as them or all these other things? Who, what's, what's, President Trump doing on the media now? How come Joe Biden's got, you know, risen and, and popular? There's, there's all this stuff that goes through people's brains that's actually completely unnecessary in terms of love and gratitude. So sure, you can watch the news for a moment, but then if your mind is caught up with that kind of revolt, you know, that carousel that's going round and round and round with the same anxieties and worries that you had yesterday, you know, those 60,000 thoughts that just keep repeating themselves, then you, you're not truly working with the immense capacity, the infinite potential of this consciousness that's sitting right here and is activated when, when you bring your mind towards a particular focus. So if you can be absorbed in a simple breath, and that's something that I practice, is just very simply breathing in love to a count of four, very simply breathing out a long exhalation of compassion with rays of light. It's like I literally see rays of light and compassionate rays of light extending out to this human family. Almost in, in every breath I can take that's not making a cup of tea where I've got to focus on not burning my hand or dealing with somebody in a um, professional capacity where also prior to meeting them, I'll go into that same state. I'll breathe in love. I'll breathe out compassion to them. They don't know that I'm doing that, right. but I'm really, really able to be centered and present and listen to everything that they're saying. And if there's something fractious that comes up in their, their discussion, I don't have to buy into that kind of conflict that they're expressing, but I can just listen and say, well, I really hear where you're coming from and that's not where I'm coming from, but I, you know, I can honor your space and I can listen to you and I can understand, or alternatively, I can walk away because it's actually really not necessary to be part of that kind of con conflict and divisive space. So my, my practice, this practice of love and blessings and gratitude and compassion is just an all pervasive thing that is in my breath and that I really encourage people who listen to actually listen with that kind of simple breathe in for a count of four, breathe in that love that, that you really deserve because it really activates the energy in your cells. As we know from research, it really helps the Im immune system and then breathe out compassion, that long exhalation, which does help the vagus nerve to come into play, which does help your parasympathetic nervous system and you relax. And th this simple, simple practices like this, really help us in our day-to-day -day life to bring about presence. Because if you look at non-dual awareness, non-dual awareness includes many, many um, aspects of you know, presence, luminosity, the soundless sound, um, non, the, the 
a, a self that no longer is a narrative self, but is a greater self, a deeper I. It involves all sorts of aspects of stillness, silence, and spaciousness, which through that initial practice, whatever you're doing, if it's done with deep focus and absorption, opens you to this spacious awareness. Suddenly the world's different. It's not full of this fractious, conflict, divisive, anxious, tense space that a lot of the world seems to think that it's in, but it's in a, an open, spacious awareness for really what is. And when you think about that, if you're focused on the anxiety, you're focused on about the 1% or less than 1% of this incredible universe that we're in. And if you focus on the love and compassion awareness that exists everywhere and this incredible power of creation underlying that, then you are starting to tune into the 99%, that, that quantum field of existence that really can touch their infinite potential that the human being has. So we kind of have that choice in every moment. Do we go for dual awareness and all the divisiveness and all the restrictions and that very small percentage of consciousness that that entails? Or do we go for non-dual awareness, com the compassion that exists, the, the quantum field and all the infinite possibilities it holds? And that's what makes me so excited. And that's what we found with our group is they keep unfolding, unfolding like lotus flowers. They keep <laughs> unfolding those petals as if the chakras in, are literally opening as they're going along the journey with us. I find that completely amazing. I am totally awestruck by what they share with us in the groups that we've done over this you know, last year. And the way that somebody who can be in a state to begin with where they're really relative beginners and newcomers to the practice can suddenly discover this whole other existence that they never knew was there. That to me, that to me is just jaw dropping awesomeness. And I, I am fully in favor of the beauty that that unfolds in the human being. So that, that to me is, is what Cody, you, and myself and Kevin and all the people listening and all the people in our raising vibration, uh, raising our vibration group are part of is, is the beauty and grace of the human being that is here and that can touch unimaginable, unimaginable gifts as most of the, you know, ancient traditions and masters have spoken about. They're, they're truly there for us to take. And now we've got neuroscience and the, the kind of adept, insight that neuroscience gives to help us with cues along the way to help us touch those parts of our practice that we're not really that sure of and then we look into the brain we say oh actually if i do this it suddenly does open my brain waves lift my brain waves do encourage this kind of synchrony this kind of coherence in the brain if i do that Oh, and I feel this at the same time. I feel a sense of ongoing awe in my day or a sense of reverence or a sense of deep, deeper power. I, ca I can do different things with my job or my family or my relationships. In practical terms, my health is improving. Look, something that I've had, you know, we, some of our members have said, look, some of the things that we've had for years, we're noticing changes. I mean, I just, I just love the, the possibilities in this, in, in what energy and consciousness holds for the human race and its, and its evolution. Yeah, I think you read your, my mind on where I wanted to go uh, next with that, because it has been taught over generations and it's amazing. It doesn't um, belittle at all what people are experiencing now, except now we have the addition of uh, the ability to take a look at the, the mind and actually collect data on this. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the neurofeedback actually helps people identify uh, crucial transition points in which they can explore deeper. I, I was hoping that uh, we could talk about um, what those transition points have been identified as. And then uh, I know you guys have been working with the neuroscientist as well to do some um, studies on your own brain waves and seeing, and I, I'd, I'd love to include, include some graphs that you guys have uh, shared with me some shifts in uh, brainwave amplitudes that, that are really interested in very much uh, worth 
um, looking into further. Mm, sure, sure. No, please, please do, and feel feel free to sh show something and ask us questions about it. I mean, you might want to start with Kevin because Kevin did a lab result with a doctor that I think shows the kind of um, similarities and tendencies and cues that we're speaking about. And I did a similar lab test with a Japanese company. And I've also been working with the, the neuroscientist. Uh, he's also a part of the raising a vibration community, Keith Rose Sullivan. And he's got yep. a, you know, a brilliant background in understanding and understanding the, the this new science in a way that where he effectively b blends both a really deep understanding of the spiritual perspectives on it, as well as the really powerful insight that science gives into the practice. So we've been lucky, you know, Holly as a research scientist yeah. and Kiefer as a neuroscientist, it's, uh, they, are, they are just, just such wonderful people to have as part of this practice with us. And so, yeah. you know, I, I truly, if anybody wants insight on either, either of those levels, both Holly and Kiefer have their own practices that they are, you know, evolving and that people can approach them and, and understand a lot more about what's going on in their own meditation practice. Yeah. I'll have to have, uh, I'll have to ask Kiefer if he wants to come on at some point. Um, Kevin, do you want to uh, talk about your experience uh, just taking a look at your own brainwaves and what insights have come out of that? Sure. Sure. So there, there's a, a sequence of meditation that we've been working with uh, for some time now. And uh, in the first um, part of the meditation, we're just focusing on breath awareness in the lower abdomen, a focused attention on the breath. So just becoming really absorbed in the sensations of breathing. And what we found in that section was that um, there's an overriding alpha, but then there's also this tight band of theta, beta, delta underneath it. And they kind of all come together and we found that in focused breathing practices that's very common that there's this coming together of these bands and they kind of ride as one and that seems to be a marker for focused breathing or for a, a really focused attention um, and then we have a section where after we're absorbed in that breathing then we raise up the energy like Stephen was talking about through the spine and uh, kind of rest the attention up in a in a space uh, above the crown of the head, and uh, there's a feeling of almost like electricity in that when you draw the energy up, and there's a very high um, vibration feeling in that. And what we've noticed there is that um, gamma and beta rise together, and and stay up as long as we our attention is focused into these high frequencies and it feels like you're supercharging your brain. It feels like your whole brain lights up with energy during that time. And, and then we uh, bring down the energy down into the heart and focus on feelings of love and compassion in the heart. And as that energy is strong and expansive also, that's a high gamma beta frequency in the graph so there's kind of a a continuum from this section up here the light the high frequency energy and the expansion out from the heart with elevated gamma and beta waves and then we drop down through the perineum into feeling the energy in the earth underneath our feet into a deep stillness and as we talked about we we found that by feeling the high energy state when we go down into the stillness there is a real wakefulness a real awareness that stays highly present as we're going deeper into stillness into silence into spaciousness and in that part of the meditation we've found that theta rises up to right underneath or sometimes peeking over alpha it's really a a uh, seems to be a theta dominant state when we're down, especially as we kind of lose the sense of being in this separate physical body and we just feel this spacious awareness or even awareness of awareness itself. And that seems to be where theta rises and joins with alpha. Um, 
then there, we've also found that within that spacious awareness that there may be spontaneous rises of energy just kind of just coming up into in the it's like the whole field brightens and there's just a heightened sense of aliveness and that kind of kind of fluctuates in and out of that kind of alpha theta space uh, so, so those are some of the things that we've um, noted and we do this meditation where we go through all of those stages together and then you can see in the graph the different those different patterns in within one meditation session that's amazing and um did you have additional work done outside of uh, using the muse headband as well yeah so um so when steven and i first start we met about a year and a half ago and we started just sharing our meditation practices and found that we were awed at how similar uh, our discoveries were in our paths and our practices and meditation and how we were doing pretty much the same type of thing. And then uh, one day, or actually a series of days, Google kept telling me that I had to buy a Muse headband. You know how it does? It just keeps putting something right in your awareness. And, and so I, I said, Stephen, what do you think about us both getting this Muse headband? And so we did. And so we had never, we hadn't really explored brainwaves in meditation. We'd meditated for 30, 35 years, but never at an EEG or even knew that much about brainwaves. So we, we got the muse and we just started posting these graphs of what we were doing. And um, we found out that we were doing things that were different from what other people were doing. And there was some controversy about that. And so we're like, well, let's, let's get some, um, let's see if that's just a function of the muse or let's get a more uh, independent lab test. So I went to have a medical EEG done with a 19 electrode cap and um, went through the same meditation process and basically got the same exact type of results um, that we saw in the muse. However, we were able to, in the higher frequencies, get more specific data because one thing that we found with the muse is when we're going into the higher frequencies muse is gated so that it will only show um, up to 50 to 60 hertz so if you're going above 50 to 60 hertz um, in the gamma frequency it starts not um, being able to give you an accurate and detailed reading it'll show that it's going up there but it won't really give you um, accurate reading there because that's we've also found that because when you are, are trying to take in that much information the data file is just too immense it's impractical to have a a a, um, a, a readout like in mind monitor taking into account above 60 hertz that's just yeah it creates the data files that we got from the uh from the lab EEG were just huge, huge, right. and, and something that took weeks to process. Okay, so being able to see your results on Mind Monitor like a minute later is pretty mind blowing, but it entails a filtering of the data to a specific gotcha. range. So, anyway, with the EEG, we found that there was um, these gamma readings up through the 60 hertz band. Uh, in this section of the meditation. And then we also found confirmed all the other things that we were seeing in use in terms of the higher theta, alpha theta state and um, the other things we were talking about. And I imagine in the lab testing, they're able to take a look at things like muscle contraction or other, uh, um, I guess, contaminants of the data too and work those things out, right? Exactly. And, th and that was part of the analysis that you know, and that takes time, you know, like in Mind Monitor, it's amazing that you, you can see something right in front of you right away, but to really go through uh, the data in that fine tooth way that, you know, even like we're doing 40, 50, 60 minute meditations, the amount of data there is mind blowing. And then when you're going through, you know, and that's through multiple sensors, right? 40, 50, 60 minutes of 19 electrodes, uh, the amount of data there is just incomprehensible. Yeah. 
So you've got to be able to go to each electrode and then zero in on maybe a one minute segment in that electrode and then go into that and see what's happening in that electrode. Uh, that just is a very labor intensive uh, process. But it, well, that's why we need bigger, faster machines to read all of our brain data, data right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, that's so again, true. we're just on the cutting edge. I mean, this is a cutting edge feel. We're just, I think, in the infancy of understanding how what we're seeing with the technology relates to these meditation practices that really are so, these states are so beyond anything we can really measure. And we're just starting to be able to measure some correlates of these experiences, right? And uh, I think we're really in the infancy of that. We're learning from each other all the time. And, and the technology, hopefully, will just keep getting better and better and more efficient. And um, yeah, so we're excited about that. You, you touched on this a little bit earlier, Kevin. Um, how, how do you feel like this data is reflecting in, in some of the uh, more... Uh, traditional meditation uh, scientific tests that have been done. Um, the book that comes to my, my mind is uh, uh, Altered Traits, um, in which they took a look at these, these frequencies. Um, would you be able to touch on that a little bit? Um, yeah, well, um, the work they're doing at University of Wisconsin is obviously some of the most groundbreaking work with, and, and they brought in, you know, very high level and very experienced meditators there and been able to uh, document states that they didn't even really even know about um, because when you're testing people who don't have that level of experience and practice um, it just doesn't show up so what one of the exciting things that they found is that these um, elevated uh, gamma states for example create long-term changes in the brain and they create levels of synchrony and coherence in the brain um, that are traits that are there um, all the time. One, one thing that was interesting in the lab, um, the baseline readings uh, in the lab that uh, I did was that there was occipital gamma readings all the time. In baseline prior, at the end of the meditation, it was just baseline or occipital gamma and and midline theta just all the time and i think that's just something that's a trait from just practicing techniques for decades and decades and uh, so that's something that the the university of wisconsin research has really been um, finding that it really is an effect of long-term practice for not just having a state change but having a trait change. And that, that's really where it, that's where it becomes exciting because you're living in a different state of consciousness all the time. Yeah, I'm sure you, the, the readings on your brain don't look anything like uh, your peers of a similar age because of uh, the amount of meditation and the, the, the length of time that you've been meditating as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's... Um, you know, again, we, we have a small sample size, so we, we're... We, uh, you know, don't, and we're also, oh, we're measuring in the community. We're always measuring people who are meditating and who have done it for a long time. So I can only imagine measuring EEGs on people in the general population and comparing them to people who are meditating, even for a short period of time and saying, wow, there's profound changes that are happening there. Yeah, practice. I think we're going to get, I think we're going to get some data pretty soon. I know, um, Interaxon as a company is, uh, collecting more amounts of data than has ever been collected before. And uh, I don't know how they're parsing out how many meditation hours people have. So that will be interesting how to get that, uh, that labeling correct. But uh, I think that's definitely ne the, the next stage here it should be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's when it, I think it can really uh, bridge to a wide population when we can show here's, here's how, the average brain is working without meditation. And here's how the brain is working with meditation. I mean, it's, I mean, we know from our personal experience how we experience it, but when we can show that uh, 
data, that'll be really powerful. What's your opinion on, um, you know, the difference between 30 years of practice uh, without neurofeedback and, and trying to speed up the process with uh, using something like the Muse and guidance from individuals such as yourself? Yeah, well, that that's uh, we've found in in the people Stephen and I are working with that the neurofeedback is just a tremendous tool. It's something that I think really accelerates the process. Um, so Stephen and I kind of came to it, you know, we were just saying, we weren't trying to achieve anything. We were just being, putting it on to being like, oh, look at that, right? And, and because we already had this practice going. But people who are um, starting out and don't really know what they're feeling or what they should be feeling or what they should be focused on, it really helps with saying, okay, well, I focused on this or I felt this and look what it did to my brain waves. Okay, so now, now let me go into my practice. Let me focus on this. Now let me look at my brain waves. And it really, that feedback, um, I, I think, is really accelerating the process. I love it. Stephen, you had your own experiences uh, in the lab and working with the, uh, the group's neuroscientist. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Cody. Uh, so I went to a Japanese lab and uh, much like Kevin was describing, when I said to them, you know, do you think you could record a 40 uh, minute meditation? They looked at me astonished and they said, look, how about we do one minute preparation, a three minute meditation and one minute up. So it was like a five minute sequence because they used an unfiltered headset, which was set for coherence. So they're um, you know, you mentioned the average person out there in data. So this particular Japanese company has dealt with top line um, c companies in Japan, you know, everybody from Toyota to Bridgestone to, you know, technology companies. And they actually have a um, headset, a portable headset, which is uh, des designed, especially when people are moving, they... It, it allows them to pick up brainwaves. So, for example, they had this wonderful experiment where they did test on Bridgestone tires and could look at people's emotional um, con emotional connection to cars with four different sets of Bridgestone tires and say unequivocally, you know, this is the one that actually people really like, even though on the surveys they're saying something different. So they tested me on one of their new um, devices and unfiltered uh, headset, which measures brain coherence. And they discovered exactly the same thing in my graphs that I showed on Muse Monitor, you know, very high in that three minute, because I only did a three minute exercise, uh, a very high gamma um, or gamma dominant brainwave, a, a very high amplitude, which they said, this shows very high concentration, <laughs> very high focused attention. It was really, really nice to get a whole different feel and different culture from the way you look at brainwaves. And they've actually, a lot, one of the professors in their program has accumulated 17 years of data with over 5,000 participants in mindful practice. So we were particularly interested in this company and this company potentially is um, somebody that we're looking at a, a venture with in the future in terms of wearables. Um, so they, they looked at a simple resting state, uh, pre-meditation, resting state, post-meditation. And much like uh, Kiefer has discovered with my raw data uh, that I've provided him with, is that I pretty much show a high gamma brainwave um, uh, graph in the focused attention sequence and in the open monitoring sequence it's primarily all theta and some of the graphs I shared with you were showed a, a very high theta dominance almost over the whole brain and overall the graph of around about 7.6. I'm not quite on Schumann resonance but you know getting close to that 7.83 coherent I figure I must be really turning into the planet through a lot of the meditations I'm doing. And it does feel like that. My, you know, through the grace of practices like Yogananda's and the Dalai Lama's, I feel really in tune with light and sound. Like I hear this vibration almost all the time and I see in my brain with eyes open or eyes closed, the, the, my environment feels lit and bright and thing, things and emotions and people are bright and really clear 
So I'm, I'm aware that my brain does operate in that theta coherence, primarily just from my felt sensations. The life is full of, of a lot of grace and it feels and looks that way. So in the, um, in the data that the Japanese company provided, it matched up with what Mind Monitor was showing and also what Kiefer uh, O'Sullivan had analyzed in terms of raw data stream. And so it showed particularly gamma ab amplitude around uh, three, three phases, around 25 hertz, around 40 hertz, and around the 60 hertz section. So my, my practice tends to be uh, as far as gamma synchrony is in those ranges and my um, and the, the stillness section is in that theta coherence in terms of you asked how does it inform that stillness when when I lift up into that love and compassion I call it the love and compassion of a divine mother it's like it feels like I'm being embraced by a cosmic mother the Yogananda used to refer to the the universe, the feminine aspect of the, the universe or the cosmos as like a divine mother. So it feels like that. It feels like I'm embraced in grace, like a, like a blessing is showering on me. And that assists my mind to when I go into the stillness section, I'm literally taking that gratitude and that embrace, that compassionate embrace, and just becoming very silent and, silent and still, and in that silence and stillness, there is no thought. It literally all drops away. There's no narrative self. There's no reference in, in terms of that. that there is in, in terms of that kind of um, focus. So it's that non-dual compassionate. The compassionate awareness that I focused on assists the open, spacious, uh, compassionate non-dual awareness by simply allowing myself that referential self with all its ideas and concepts to drop out completely and it does show in my brain the brain waves all separate they kind of go into a parallel just a straight simple parallel and theta as the um as the mullet wavelets graph shows and as uh, uh the japanese company's analysis shows theta is coherent over this the stillness and uh, silence stillness section so i'm aware that that really deep gratitude and that really deep feeling of being blessed informs the stillness section so that when i start to focus on the breathing and absorb in the breathing it's really similar to the anapanasati sutra i mean i'm not really doing anything different than that i think the buddha and yogananda and the uh, the piece of uh, of the Christ consciousness, they're all incredibly similar. They're all, we shouldn't be making divisions in our religions. There's just such a wealth of wisdom that kind of can inform our awareness. So when we go into that awareness, when we're really in, if we've managed to cultivate that high lit space of gratitude, and then we fall and lit, literally be still in that it, it's like, it feels like a band of stillness opens. For me, it's like enormous distance to the right and enormous distance behind me. And then as, as if a sphere of stillness that's so deep and profound and pure opens, and I, I'm not there. There is, of course, and there's a subtle awareness, but then there is a timelessness and a space that opens where I could be sitting there. I've got no idea what, what the time is. Sometimes I come out of the meditation. It's an hour. Sometimes I come out. It's been shorter, you know, 30 or 40 minutes. Sometimes it's been a couple of hours. I, I did some practices, you know, early on when I first, uh, was, uh, first was exploring Muse and I did some practices and there was just such a deep level of absorption and I had no idea that I'd been in the practice for an hour or more. And that, that sense of timelessness is a really good indication that that narrative self has actually dropped out and you, you the deeper you, is in a space of really deep, compassionate, non-dual awareness. So you, that, I, for me, that theme of compassion runs through both the focused attention on compassion and the 
open monitoring of uh, compassionate non-dual awareness space. So I was curious because uh, it seems to be the main practice is using um, Muse or Mind Monitor, uh, the name for it at, at this point, and using Muse. Um, what is your, what is your take on the regular meditation app with Muse? Uh, what does it seem to respond to best, or is it even worth diving in too deep to it? Because it's it's, it's sort of uh, you know like a its own neurofeedback system compared to doing your own Muse monitor system. Right, right. You, I think you've summed it up. It is its own neurofeedback system, and I think when you get in to this practice and you you're just starting. I think it's really helpful. It helps you identify, you know, through the birds and the rain. And so it helps you identify that. I have to be honest and say, I used it once and I realized it was giving me certain feedback that I didn't really need or, or want or desire at that time because I was doing a completely different practice. And uh, I think you're right. It's, it's designed to really help the, the user at a point in their practice to understand states that they're going through and understand, uh, okay, this is maybe how I get become calm. This is how I can collaborate, uh, calibrate the system. I think actually just working through that, working through, oh, what does calibration mean? What does it mean to put on a headset? What does it mean to fit it properly? What does it mean to sit down and actually listen to something and take some cues and get some neurofeedback. I think that's actually what it's designed to do, which is to give you some basic neurofeedback. But most of the Muse community members that I've had the really good fortune to connect with have gone almost straight on to, like myself, onto Mind Monitor and have been more looking for those cues and feedback from the actual brainwaves themselves in relationship to their practice and then shared and tried to look really closely at, okay, if we take the, the graph, what, what does that say? Can we share and understand what a, a person's graph shows when it does this? And okay, this is the, the practice that I'm doing and these are the inner states. I can maybe correlate the, the graph, this graph of, for example, a more dominant delta to this kind of really deep absorption. And I, maybe I can relate this gamma dominant to maybe a more um, absorbed in uh, high, high focused attention kind of practice. And maybe I can uh, relate this more dominant theta to a really deep sense of relaxation, uh, which seems to go along with alpha and shows kind of some similar, similar propensities and maybe I can relate the when I've got a lot of beta in my graph to okay I am maybe over focused or yeah. maybe I've I'm I'm integrating information but it's perhaps in an overly focused way. So there's lots of things I the the work of Anna Wise and and the um awakened brain I I think she's done some really lovely work on helping people to understand different exercises that go along with different brain frequencies. Because in a in a in a way, Kevin and I are doing that very kind of similar work. You know, if you focus in this way, then you will get a response from your brain with this with practice. And then if you work with your breath in this way, as Kevin said, you'll get this really uh, strong focused brain waves and there'll be, uh, um, there'll be brain waves that start to unify. There'll be coherence with this kind of cue. You'll get synchrony if you start to breathe in a particular way with deep absorption in this kind of way. Yeah. What I noticed is uh, if you kind of just have a relaxed attention on a meditative object, it seems to respond well. But as soon as you try to raise your energy within the regular meditation app, it goes haywire. It's like, doesn't know how to handle all the flexibility that uh, we're talking about in this pod, in this, uh, this interview, Kevin, you had something to add. Yeah. I, I think that it's, it, as I experimented with it a lot at the beginning, when I first got news, um, what I found was it's, um, it seems to be ideally designed for somebody who's um, coming from a place where they're stressed and distracted mm -hmm. and then bringing them into a state of calm and relaxation. And the feedback, if that's where you are in, the pra in your practice, that could just be an invaluable tool yeah. to be able to come from that stressed and anxious and distracted state 
and come into a state of calm, focus, relaxed, focused. Um, it seems to be really good at doing that. And that is a foundation for all meditation practices, right? So it, that's a great place to start because you need to be able to do that at the beginning of every meditation is to, is to focus inwardly and consciously relax. So I think it's ideal for that stage of practice. But as far as like raising your energy levels, imagining, or at least even feeling this energy moving up through your spine, that type of thing, uh, what was your experience when you tried to do these practices just using the regular Muse Meditation app and oh, yeah. feeling so like Muse Monitor was a better weather. choice? It be stormy weather. <laughs> right, right. And that, yeah, that, that's what I notice every time, you know, it's like you can really get the birds if you sit there, but it almost gets a little uh, boring, to be honest, because you want to reach those higher levels and um, get further into it. So tell me, please, what's, what's next for uh, Raising Your Vibration group? Where are you guys, uh, what's your ideas going forward? I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. So we're, um, well, right now we're, we're in the middle of another, running another group through our 10-week course in Subtle Energy Meditation. Uh, we have an editor that, we've written a book called Raising Our Vibration. We have an editor working on that now. So we're, we're looking to publish that this year. And we've developed a meditation app um, that is, has all these guided meditations of 60 different guided meditations on it and some coherent breathing timer and, and some tools like that. Um, so that'll be out in the next couple weeks. And then we have our Raising Our Vibration community on Facebook. Um, and, and people are, you know, we post exercises. Stephen and I are doing a lot of short, simple consciousness shifting exercises on YouTube these days. So we post those on the community and on YouTube. Just things that people can do in three to six minutes to uh, quickly shift their state of consciousness. Um, so we post those on, on the page and a lot of people are sharing meditations and, and um, other consciousness raising practices. So, well, for one, I, I can't wait to check out your, your guys' app. I'm going to be listening to those meditations for sure because I know I need more guidance personally in these subtle ed energy um, guidances. And I've learned so much in talking to you guys today. I really appreciate you coming on uh, Tech for Psych and us, us having this conversation. Mm, cool. Yeah, Cody. Cody, Cody, thank you so much. With great thanks to Holly because Holly, as the research scientist, has really – helped us to look at the data closely and along with Kiefer O'Sullivan and quite a number of other members. So we formed a research group, which is another arm of the Raising Our Vibration family. And that research group is looking at compassionate non-dual awareness with a number of researchers from different parts of the world. So we are hoping in the future to look at research through the development of a wearable potentially, and also through uh, much deeper research, you know, data that will cover what, what, a, what is non-dual awareness, what is compassionate non-dual awareness, and how can we measure this? And so we've got as part of this, uh, the Japanese company that I've been in contact with and a number of other companies, as well as a number of universities and researchers from the uh, professors and researchers from those universities. So at this point, I'm not at liberty to say exactly who those are because we're also tying up those ventures with them. But the exciting part of it really is not who they are, but the fact that they've actually taken an interest in this type of groundbreaking research that you, Cody, and us, and all everybody gathered here is involved in. I think that's, to me, been the, the, the jewel, you know, the fruit of this whole ground. Because I kind of feel to, together we're working on you know, a, a ground of presence in this planet to really ground it, to get out of all that conflict, to bring this planet back to peace. And the fact that this, these universities and these companies are really deeply interested in, you know, developing wearables that look at compassionate awareness, that develop an app that look at happiness, calmness, compassion, 
and high energy frequencies. So what does that mean to develop a headset that can actually measure those? What does it mean to develop a simple portable that can measure coherence and synchrony and give people access to that type of information? And what does it mean potentially in the future to develop a wearable that would measure uh, coherence of subtle energy? So not just the brain, but the heart, and the subtle energy of the body and the subtle energy centers. So I'm including the chakras, the nadis, the meridians, the, the energy rivers that run through our being. So that, to me, is a very, very exciting part of future research. So ultimately, you know, this might be a, a five-year journey or more, but ultimately for me, that would be a really rewarding uh, extra arm of this journey of consciousness that we're all on. And that is to keep that science aspect of what we're all adventuring and uh, alongside and say, look, if we are developing this consciousness, this spacious, non-dual, compassionate awareness as a human being, how do we measure that? And what form does a wearable that everybody on the planet could use and what how would we show that in terms of an app or some kind of measurement that makes sense to your average person which was what interested us about the japanese company is they're dealing with everyday household kind of person and the kinds of emotions and uh, views of happiness in life that that the average person is interested in because if, if ultimately the work we're doing here can lead us into happiness, then I think our world's in a good place. Well, I can't wait to see what you guys um, develop over the course of the years. We're going to have to make this a reoccurring uh, interview just to catch up with you guys every couple of months <laughs> to see what's going on. So uh, uh, we'd love th thanks again for coming on. <laughs> thank you, Cody. So yeah, Thank you, Cody. Yeah, we're so right. grateful to you, truly. It's, it's been a real joy. If you want to contact us um, through our webpage, that's probably the easiest way, raisingourvibration.net. And there, if you have any questions, we have an email link there. You can email us. Uh, we also have a link there to join our Raising Our Vibration community page on Facebook. And that's another great, great place to contact us and kind of be a part of what we're doing. Great. I'll put the uh, links in the description for people to check out. Okay. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks, Cody. Thank you so much. That was wonderful.